This is Julia. Julia is an excellent student. Her professor sees her in an empty hallway, sitting in a chair, and Julia appears distressed. Her excellent work in class and her healthy, casual appearance left her professor unprepared for her first words. I feel like I'm losing my mind, Julia said. Can I talk to you? Julia's professor invites her to come to her office, and over the next hour, Julia describes her own personal hell. She describes working hard to hide a world of crippling fear, anxiety, and depression. At work, she's deathly afraid of talking to coworkers and customers. Her social phobia led to frequent absenteeism and avoidance. At school, Julia feels different and is sure that other students think that she's weird. Lately, she's been so depressed that she's found it difficult to get out of bed in the morning and to do the things that she once enjoyed. Julia's request to talk was a turning point for her. At a time when she was becoming her own worst enemy, Julia realized that she needed help. Her professor encouraged her to talk with a therapist. With psychotherapy and some temporary help from an antidepressant medication, Julia's therapist was able to help her to come to grips with her emotions and regain her balance. The portion of this module focuses on the methods that are used to alleviate problems like Julia's. We'll be exploring insight therapies, behavior therapies, and biomedical therapies. And we'll then conclude with a look at what therapies we surveyed have in common and whether they're effective. Let's begin by questioning your assumptions. As a young wizard at Hogwarts, Harry Potter fought many kinds of evil. The Dementors, though, were among the worst, stealing happiness and good memories from people with each indrawn breath. The Dementors left their victims with only sadness and fear, alone in their struggle against the very worst of their thoughts. J.K. Rowling is the author of the wildly successful Harry Potter books, and she understood the Dementors as well. After all, she lived with them for a number of years during her mid-20s. In Rowling's universe, though, the Dementors have another name, depression. Rowling was a single parent while writing her first book about Harry Potter, and she was so poor that she was living on welfare. Life was difficult, and she felt herself sinking deeper into depression. It was her young daughter who finally helped her realize that she needed to do something about her struggles with mental health. So gathering her courage, she decided to seek help from her family doctor. But as some of you know, depression can be hard to talk about with others. And Rowling has said that she actually rehearsed what she wanted to say so that she could speak clearly to the doctor about her thoughts and feelings. She arrived at the clinic only to find that her doctor was away. The physician who was standing in was somewhat unconcerned about her worries and told her to come back and see a nurse if she continued to feel a bit low. It was only her doctor's conscientious review of the reports written in her absence that things turned around. Noting that Rowling had been in to discuss her depression, the doctor was horrified that she'd been sent away without any support. So she called right away and had Rowling return to the clinic. Much later in an interview with a student journalist, Rowling would explain how important that call was in putting her on the path to recovery. She absolutely saved me because I don't think I would have had the guts to go and do it twice. Having been dismissed once, I'd give it my best shot and I went back and I felt worse than ever. But she called me back and I went for counseling, cognitive behavioral counseling. So this is a story about seeking help for mental health issues like depression. And Rowling's doctor recommended cognitive behavioral therapy. This is a form of counseling that you're going to be learning about. And this was used to treat her depression. But there are a wide variety of possible treatments, including both drugs and various types of counseling that can be used to manage the different types of psychological disorders. Think about what you've learned from reading about J.K. Rowling, as well as your current understanding about treatment and therapy for psychological disorders. Which of the following statements do you think is true? Is it A, in some cases, 
Hospitalization is necessary to treat very severe forms of mental illness. Is it B, drugs are the most effective way to treat all psychological disorders? Is it C, counseling is the most effective way to treat all psychological disorders? Or is it D, there is no stigma associated with seeking help for disorders. These days, people are quite prepared to admit to any type of mental health problem. What do you think? In this video, we'll be looking at various forms of therapy, and we'll look at the overall characteristics of effective therapy. And what you'll find is that drugs are not the most effective way to treat all psychological disorders, but drugs can be very effective, especially when coupled with counseling. Counseling can also be very effective, and some people can do very well without medication. Each individual is different. What you've also learned is that for many people, they feel that there is a stigma associated with seeking help for psychological disorders. And so many people who need help don't seek help. What is true here is that in some cases, hospitalization is necessary to treat very severe forms of mental illness. So let's get started. If you want treatment, you can choose among psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, social workers, and others. Therapists use many methods and they use empirically supported treatments, therapies that have been demonstrated to be helpful. And these demonstrations have been done through research. Many therapists follow published manuals that specify exactly how to treat various disorders. And because insurers limit the number of sessions that they'll reimburse for a given client, Therapists have worked to develop briefer therapies where they can accomplish as much as they can in a moderate number of sessions. There are three main categories of therapy. These include insight therapies, behavior therapies, and biomedical therapies. In this video, you're going to be learning about each of these categories of therapy. Before we begin looking at the various types of therapy, I wanted to share with you who tends to seek treatment? And what you'll notice here is that in regards to marital status, utilization rates are particularly high among those who are divorced or separated. The use of therapy is greater among those who have more education. And in terms of age, utilization peaks in the 35 to 44 age bracket. You'll also notice that females are more likely to pursue therapy than males but the utilization rates are extremely low among ethnic minorities. So I'd ask you to think about this. Think about who tends to utilize therapy and think about why. Why do we see more women utilizing therapy? Why do we see people who are within a particular age group, 35 to 44, being in the peak utilization group? And why do we see that utilization rates are particularly high among people who are divorced or separated? And then finally, why do you think that utilization rates are extremely low among ethnic minorities? What can we do to increase utilization rates so that people who need help seek the help that they need? Let's begin by looking at insight therapies. Insight therapies involve verbal interactions that are intended to enhance clients' self-knowledge and promote healthful changes in personality and behavior. They include psychoanalysis, client-centered therapy, positive psychology, and group therapy. Let's begin by looking at psychoanalysis. Psychodynamic therapies attempt to understand conflicting impulses, including some that the person doesn't consciously recognize. We often think of Sigmund Freud when we think about the psychodynamic perspective. And here in this image, you'll see a picture of Freud's couch. And this is in Vienna, Austria. And what's really interesting is that his couch became so famous that there was a company in New York that decided at the time that they were going to manufacture what they called psychoanalytic sofas. And these were sofas that shouldn't be too hard, they shouldn't be too soft, they needed to be just right. It kind of reminds me of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. 
So just right so that the patient doesn't fall asleep, but they feel comfortable. And it's important for the patient to feel comfortable because what we're trying to get at here is what's going on in the unconscious. And a person needs to be relaxed. They need to feel like they're not being judged. And so when a person would come to see Freud or other psychoanalysts, you'd find that that person is not going to be even facing that psychoanalyst. They're likely going to be looking the other way so that they're just saying whatever is coming to mind. We might also think of Alfred Adler. You learned about him when you learned about personality. And if we were to focus on Alfred Adler, what you would find is that he would look for power and superiority motives that were in the unconscious, whereas Freud was focusing on sexual motives. And even though these approaches have different goals in terms of what they're looking for, they're both psychodynamic because the focus is on the unconscious. So psychodynamic therapists or psychoanalysts use what's called psychoanalysis. And this approach tries to bring unconscious thoughts and emotions into consciousness. So this is an insight-oriented therapy. Psychoanalysts offer interpretations of what the client says. That is, that they try to explain the underlying meaning. And sometimes they might have some conflict and discussion with the client about these interpretations. And when they do this, they may regard a client's disagreement as resistance. So for example, a client who's begun to touch on an anxiety provoking topic may turn the conversation to something trivial. So they might change the subject or they might simply forget to come to the next session. But people like Freud would say that there are no accidents. You don't accidentally forget your appointment. At some unconscious level, you didn't want to come to the appointment because perhaps you were accessing things in your unconscious that were uncomfortable and you're trying to protect yourself from what's being revealed. So when a client is doing this, when they're changing the subject or they're forgetting to come to the next session, this is called resistance and the psychoanalyst is going to want to analyze this resistance. Another technique is what's called dream analysis. And this is an attempt to seek to understand the symbolism that's reported in dreams. And even a therapist who doesn't look for deep symbolism can use dreams to understand how the client understands the world. Psychoanalysts also attend to transference. And this is where a client transfers onto the therapist the behaviors and feelings that they originally established towards their father, their mother, or other important people in their lives. Today, psychoanalysts modify Freud's approach in many ways. The goal is still to bring about a reorganization of the personality, changing a person from the inside out by helping that person to understand the hidden reasons behind their actions. So here we have, instead of why did the chicken cross the road, it's why do you think you need to cross the road? Humanistic psychologists also use an insight approach, and they believe that people can decide deliberately the kind of person that they want to be. So all of this is happening within our consciousness, very different from psychoanalysts or that psychodynamic perspective. So the humanistic therapist believes that once people are freed from a feeling of rejection or failure, they can solve their own problems. Think about yourselves. Do you think that when you are fearful of rejection or you're fearful of failure, that that can hinder your ability to solve your own problems? How helpful would it be for you to be freed from rejection or failure fears? And if you have those feelings, think about how they have hindered your own ability to reach your own potential. And so the humanistic psychologist is focusing on ultimately helping you to reach your fullest potential. If you'll remember Maslow, Maslow focused on his, he had his interest in people reaching their fullest potential by becoming self-actualized. And you'll remember that to be self-actualized is to be all that you can be. And he came up with that hierarchy of needs. You'll also remember that not many people are self-actualized, but 
over time, we can overcome or we can meet those lower level needs and then higher level needs within the hierarchy. And it then becomes easier for us to reach our potential. And some of those needs involve things like our need for feeling good about ourselves, our need to feel like we belong. And so as a humanistic psychologist, you're going to find that there's a focus on helping that person to meet those needs and certain behaviors and traits that might be getting in the way of meeting those needs. A very well-known humanistic psychologist is Carl Rogers. And Carl Rogers' version of humanistic therapy is called person-centered therapy. And this is also known as non-directive or client-centered therapy. And this is where the therapist listens to the client with total acceptance and unconditional positive regard. Now, most of the time, the therapist paraphrases and then clarifies what the client has said. They're going to convey messages like, I'm trying to understand the experience from your point of view, or, um, you know, they're going to want to be doing things like active listening. They're going to strive to be genuine and empathetic. They're going to be caring, and they're seldom going to be offering, if ever, going to be offering any interpretation or advice because they believe the client has the answers within themselves and they want to help the client to realize that. Few therapists today, though, rely entirely on this type of approach, but most therapists, regardless of their methods, they follow the emphasis on listening carefully to the client and to developing a caring and honest relationship between themselves and their client. Think about the qualities that you see here of this type of therapist. And ultimately, these are the qualities we would seek in a friend. And if we think about our friendships, we find that one great benefit is being able to be open and honest. And hopefully, if we have a friend who is genuine and cares for us unconditionally, then we feel like we can be ourselves. And this is what the therapist is doing. Of course, they're not your friend per se, but they are providing you with that environment that can help you to fully reach your potential where you feel like you can be yourself and recognize that you have the skills and ability to be your own or reach your own full potential. Overall, when we think about the factors that make different types of insight therapies effective, there are some key features. One is developing an alliance with a professional helper. So regardless of the approach, this is an important quality. And then providing emotional support and an empathic understanding from the therapist. Empathic means that the therapist is putting themselves in your shoes and they're doing this genuinely. So it really feels like they do get it, they understand. And then a third quality is the cultivation of hope and positive expectations. And then the provision of a rationale for one's problems and a method for alleviating them. And then finally, the opportunity to express feelings and to confront problems and to gain new insights and to learn new patterns of behavior. Behavior therapists assume that abnormal or perhaps better called atypical behavior is learned and can be unlearned. What do you think? Behaviorists identify the behavior that needs to be changed like fear or a bad habit, and then they set about changing it through reinforcement and other principles of learning. They may try to understand the causes of behavior as a first step towards changing it, but unlike psychoanalysts, they're more interested in changing behaviors than they are in understanding their hidden meanings. How effective do you think this type of therapy would be for a person like Julia, who you learned about at the very beginning of this video? If you were seeking therapy, would you prefer to gain insight or would you prefer to focus on changing behaviors? Behavior therapy begins with a clear, well-defined goal, like eliminating test anxiety. And then it attempts to achieve this goal through learning. Setting a clear goal allows both the therapist and the client to judge whether the therapy is succeeding. If the client shows no improvement, then the procedure can be changed. 
behavior therapies utilize classical and operant conditioning principles. As you'll remember, when we think about classical conditioning, we can think of classic examples like Pavlov's dog and little Albert. As we think about operant conditioning, we can think about Skinner and the pigeons. Remember, Skinner focused on reinforcement and punishment. So think for a moment about how you could use reinforcement or punishment to change behaviors that may not be adaptive. And think about how the principles of classical conditioning could also be used. So here's an example. We could use classical conditioning to train a child who continues wetting the bed after the usual age of toilet training. We could train them to wake up when the bladder is full. So this approach is actually pretty simple. A parent or caregiver purchases a bedwetting alarm, which actually came about many years ago, almost three quarters of a century ago. And we know that bedwetting is not an uncommon problem among children and parents often try to find different solutions to resolve this. And so the parent purchases a bedwetting alarm and then the child will start to wet during sleep and then the bedwetting alarm sounds. The child then has to wake up and go to the bathroom to empty their bladder and then they'll eventually learn to wake up by themselves. Now, the point of this, though, is not to teach the child to wake up during sleep. It's actually intended to teach the child to identify the sign from the bladder to the brain. And to stay dry at night, the child doesn't need to wake up. They can learn to control themselves by contracting their muscles that are around the bladder, and this will relieve the pressure. And so the alarm also works on the behavioral concept of learning by avoidance. If you want to avoid waking up at night to go to the bathroom, don't wet the bed. So here we have two different approaches or two different theories going on. We have classical conditioning where there's an association. And then we also have the removal of something that is uncomfortable, which is getting up out of bed. And so we have negative reinforcement. So we can see just the very practical use of something like this in changing behaviors that can make a pretty big difference in the life of a child and family. So how might we use behavioral principles in our own lives? Well, they're very practical. If we want to change behaviors, we could, for example, we could create a good environment with nice lighting and clean surfaces for your home office to make it a more positive work environment. So a good working environment, you're addressing the environment can condition you to get more work done. So there's a focus on the environment. You could also, let's say, create a bedtime routine where you condition yourself to get to sleep earlier. And you find that lots of parents do this with their kids. And you find also that adults do this for themselves. And when you do this, you might dim the lights, avoid screens 30 minutes before bed. And so what you're doing is you're conditioning yourself to associate that certain time of the night with relaxation and it will help you to go to sleep more easily. Or let's say that you have a pet. So we can use these principles in the application of training pets. So we might train a pet to do basic obedience behaviors or special tricks by asking them to do the task and then rewarding them in the same way over and over. Or we could use classical conditioning and perhaps use a bell or some other device to let your pet know when dinner is coming and when they should be sitting and being patient. You can also use these principles in training children, teaching good behaviors to children by rewarding them with a small treat or something like a new toy. Uh, if they struggle with sharing, reward them when they make an effort to share. I know with my kids, I try very heavily to focus on reinforcement so that what I'm doing is re strongly emphasizing what I want to see in my kids. And although I do use punishment, I try to minimize the use of it. What research suggests is that yes, punishment can tell us what not to do, but if we really want to train people to do what is healthy and what we want them to do, we need to focus on reinforcement. Punishment only tells us what not to do. So behavioral interventions, behavioral therapies focus on reinforcement. They also focus on um, classical conditioning. And so we're gonna be looking at some very specific approaches that are used 
in this particular way of therapy or approach to therapy. One type of behavioral approach that utilizes classical conditioning principles is what's called systematic desensitization. This is an evidence-based therapy approach, and it combines relaxation with gradual exposure to help a person slowly overcome a phobia. So during systematic desensitization, and by the way, this is also called graduated exposure therapy, um, this person will work their way up through levels of fear, and they start with the least fearful exposure. Now, this approach also involves the use of relaxation techniques, and it involves three main steps. So let's look at these. First, the person learns muscle relaxation techniques. Then they create a list of the things that they fear with their therapist. So they're going to rank those items that they fear in terms of intensity. And then finally, they are exposed to what they fear and they're exposed progressively. So classical conditioning is that underlying theory behind the process. You're creating a new association. And the goal is to overcome a phobia by replacing feelings of fear and anxiety with a state of calm. And as the client works their way through the list of fears, they continue to focus on relaxation when facing each new situation until it no longer causes discomfort. So what I've provided here for you is an example of a behavior therapist's instructions. Not everyone knows how to relax. It's something that has to be learned. And so there are different approaches to relaxation. There's something called diaphragmatic breathing. And this is where a person learns to regulate their breathing by breathing slowly and deeply through their nose and then holding their breath for one or two seconds and then breathing out of their mouth. And then there's visualization. So you focus on a relaxing scene, um, picturing your mind, that scene and concentrating on sensory details. This is, um, includes things like guided imagery. And then there's also something called progressive muscle relaxation. And this is where you learn to tense up and release muscles throughout your body. So take your fists right now and clench them as tight as you can and feel how tense that feels and then let go. And you'll notice when you let go, that feeling of relaxation of letting go is much more noticeable than just having never clenched your fist. So when you tense up and release, you're learning that experience or that feeling of relaxation. And then there's also meditation and mindfulness. And learning meditation can help people to be more aware of their thoughts and their feelings. And then mindfulness is where you notice what you're experiencing in the present moments. And that can really help be helpful in reducing anxious thoughts. So different approaches that therapists can take in training and relaxation. Here's one that I've provided for you. This is a, uh, a script that a therapist might read or they might say something similar to this. So let all your muscles go loose and heavy. Just settle back quietly and comfortable. Wrinkle up your forehead now. And I won't read through this, but I wanted you to get the gist that you can see as you read this that it's very specific and there are, you know, the, there are specific instructions being provided to the client to guide them through that process. And here it continues. And for those of you who don't know how to relax, you've not practiced this, this is something that's helpful outside of systematic desensitization, of course. It can be very helpful before taking a test. Research suggests that when we're anxious, when we're stressed, it can make us more forgetful. It can affect our ability to focus. And so doing relaxation exercises like this before a test can be very helpful in improving cognition and improving test performance. So if you have test anxiety, relaxing beforehand and using specific strategies can be helpful. I'd encourage you to, uh, to do a search on YouTube or just an overall online search for some some suggestions or strategies to do this. And I've also put some of these on our course website as I had sent an email out to you all about that. I think it was within, um, perhaps it was within your personality chapter. I can't recall which module I put that in, but I would encourage you to take a look at that handout as well. There's some great tips for you. So these are some great instructions, very useful. And again, that therapist's first step is providing relaxation training. 
After the client learned these relaxation techniques with their therapist, they develop a fear hierarchy for what they have a phobia of. And this hierarchy typically involves at least 10 levels of fear. So first, the client will identify what they feel is the most frightening level of their fear. We could call this a level 10 fear, or in this image, we could call it a level 100 fear. Next, what the client is going to do is identify the least frightening level of their fear, or the level one fear. And then the client will list the levels in between and rank them by the amount of fear that they trigger. So, for example, seeing a photo of what you fear might be a level 30, okay? But actually touching the thing that you fear could be a level 90 or 95. And then next, with the therapist, the client will develop ways to expose themselves to each level of the fear. And then this is done so gradually. So gradually that person is going to be exposed to each level of what they fear while they relax. And the moment that they feel anxiety or stress, they're going to go back down in the hierarchy to a lower level, something that they fear less. And then once they feel calm, they move back up the hierarchy until they're able to get to the top of that hierarchy and experience that fear with feelings of relaxation. So you see, this is straightforward classical conditioning. And here's an example of the use of systematic desensitization to help a client to overcome the fear of snakes. You'll see that in the upper left-hand corner, the person is looking at an image of a snake, and then they are holding an image of a snake, and then there is a snake that is in front of them, and so forth. And you'll notice that you could actually measure the pulse rate in beats per minute while the person is exposed to each level of this hierarchy. Now remember, that person is going to be simultaneously practicing those relaxation techniques. And the moment that they begin to fear, feel anxiety or experience distress, then they're going to be moving back down the hierarchy until they can feel relaxed, and then they move back up. Another behavioral approach to therapy is what's called aversion therapy. And this also utilizes the principles of classical conditioning, where you're trying to create a new association. In the case of systematic desensitization, you're trying to create an association that is positive so that the person doesn't have the fear of whatever it was that they've been fearing. With aversion therapy, you're doing something very different you're wanting to create an aversion or a dislike of something that you want the client or the client themselves wants to stop. So typically, this type of therapy is used to help a person to give up a behavior or a habit by associating that behavior or habit with something that's unpleasant. And it's most known for treating people with addictive behaviors, like those that are found, for example, in alcohol use disorder. So most of the research on this type of therapy has been focused on its benefits related to substance use and abuse. Now I will say that this type of therapy is controversial and the research is fairly mixed. And this is not often the first line treatment and there are other therapies that can be used, but this is a therapy that is utilized. And it can be effective, especially in treating addictive behavior. So, how does it work? So remember, as I said, aversion therapy is based off the theory of classical conditioning. And remember, classical conditioning is when you automatically learn a behavior due to a specific stimuli. In other words, you learn to respond to something based on repeated interactions with it. And so aversion therapy uses this concept and it focuses on creating a negative response to an undesirable stimulus, like drinking excess amounts of alcohol or using drugs. And so again, many times in people with substance use disorders, this can be utilized, it can be very effective. Sometimes it's not effective for clients, but it can be effective. And so what's happened with people who have substance use disorders is that their body has been conditioned to get pleasure from the substance that they've been abusing. So it may be that that substance tastes good. It might make them feel good. Typically, that's the reason that they like it. It makes them feel good. It gets rid of feelings of anxiety. And so in aversion therapy, the idea is to change that. 
And so the exact way aversion therapy is performed depends on the undesirable behavior or the habit that's being treated. And so it's actually pretty commonly used if among, if we look at aversion therapy, probably the more common use is for alcohol use disorder. And the goal is to reduce a person's craving for alcohol with a chemically induced nausea. And so what happens in this type of aversion therapy is that a doctor administers a drug that causes nausea or vomiting if the person being treated drinks alcohol. And then they give them alcohol so that the person gets sick. This is then repeated until the person begins to associate drinking alcohol with feeling ill, and then they no longer crave alcohol. Modeling is another approach that utilizes behavioral principles. The focus here is on learning. So the individual learns through observation and imitation of others. So what they're doing is they are watching a model who's demonstrating the desired behavior. And they're typically doing this in a step-by-step -step gradual process while the client is encouraged to imitate the model. So in this picture here, a model might first approach a dog and then touch the dog, and then pet the dog, and then finally hug the dog. So let's imagine they're doing this in front of a child or adult who fears dogs, and then this adult or child would watch this process and then be encouraged to repeat the steps that the model has demonstrated. So as you've learned in this course, and you know based on your own experience, reinforcement is important in shaping behavior. Remember that reinforcement is the strengthening of a response by following it with a pleasurable consequence, and that's positive reinforcement, or removing an unpleasant stimulus, and that's negative reinforcement. In behavioral therapy, reinforcement can be used in many ways. One example is through what is called a token economy. And this is where objects that are called tokens are used to reinforce behavior, and the tokens can be accumulated and exchanged for desired items or privileges. You all may have experienced token economies when you were in elementary school and you engaged in what the teacher thought was a desired behavior. Perhaps you were behaving, you turned your homework in on time, you had neat handwriting, whatever it might be, and then you earned tokens. And those might be in the form of stars or stickers or points, and then you could trade those in for treasure, something in the treasure box or something that she had that was of value that had a certain amount of points attributed to it. So token economies have also been used successfully in modifying the behavior of people who have severe mental illness, and even in those who are in mental hospitals. This can include, for example, people with schizophrenia or people with major depression. Another example of the use of reinforcement is through what's called a contingency contract. This is a formal written agreement between the therapist and client, or it could be a teacher and a student, or it could be between two couples where a couple or with where goals for behavior change, reinforcements and penalties are very clearly stated so that each couple understands or each partner in the couple understands what the other expects and wants. So that, for example, let's say that household responsibilities have been something that the couple argues about. So having a behavioral contract where it's understood what each person's responsibilities are can be very effective. Between teacher and student, you could use these same principles. You can use these principles in a variety of situations. Another approach to therapy focuses on thinking. So as we look at this, think about Julia at the beginning of this video and how we might use this approach to helping Julia. So 
Suppose someone asks for your opinion and then asks someone else as well. You might react, well, it's good to get several opinions, or you might feel hurt that your opinion wasn't good enough. Your emotions depend not only on the events, but also on how you interpret them. Cognitive therapy seeks to improve our well-being by challenging our interpretation of events. And cognitive therapists identify distressing thoughts like people don't like me or my enemies are out to get me, and they encourage the client to explore the evidence behind them, much like a scientist would evaluate evidence. The therapist isn't necessarily promoting an optimistic outlook, but one that is realistic. After all, if people really don't like you, or if you really have enemies, you should know about it. Usually though, the client discovers that their beliefs are unjustified, and the therapist helps the client to identify unrealistic beliefs and abandon unrealistic goals, like a need to excel all the time, to always be perfect. And cognitive therapy also encourages people to find opportunities for things like activity or pleasure and a sense of accomplishment. Now, many therapists combine features of behavior therapy and cognitive therapy to form what is very popularly used, and that is cognitive behavior therapy. And this is where therapists set explicit behavioral goals, but they also try to change people's interpretation of situations. So for example, they might help a client to distinguish between serious problems and imagined or exaggerated problems. Then they try to change their client's behavior in handling the more serious problems. Another approach to therapy is what's called family systems therapy or family therapy. We'll also be looking at group therapy and self-help groups. So let's start with family therapy. The guiding assumption here is that most people's problems develop in a family setting and that the best way to deal with them is to improve family relationships and communication. So a family therapist may use behavior therapy, cognitive therapy, or other techniques. So what distinguishes family therapists is that they prefer to talk with two or more members of the family together. And solving most problems requires changing the family dynamics and any individual's behavior. Group therapy is administered to several people at once. And while the pioneers of psychotherapy saw that clients individually benefit from individual therapy, there are also, and there are many benefits, of course, like privacy, having group therapy can have many benefits. Now, it first became popular because of economic reasons, where you're spreading the cost among several people, and this can make it more affordable. And then soon what happened was that therapists discovered that there are other advantages to group therapy, like just meeting other people with similar problems can be reassuring. Think about Julia. Do you think she could benefit from group therapy? Group therapy also lets people examine how they relate to others. It helps them to practice social skills and to receive feedback. Let's now look at self-help groups. One that you might think of is Alcoholics Anonymous, and this operates much like group therapy, except without a therapist. Each participant both gives and receives help, and people who have experienced a problem can offer special insight to others with the same problem. In some places, people with mental health issues have organized self-help centers as an alternative to mental hospitals, and these small home-like environments can, can sometimes include professional therapists, though sometimes they may not. And instead of treating people as patients who need medical help, what they do is they expect people to take responsibility for their own actions. For most types of disorders, um, these facil facilities can produce results that are, um, can be very effective and the clients often like them better than they would if they were in a more um, significant facility or a more serious facility, like a, of course a mental hospital. So think back at Julia. Do you think she would benefit from any of these approaches? And which of these do you think she would benefit the most from and why? Or do you think she might benefit from all of them? So what is it that makes therapy effective? 
Well, it turns out that the effectiveness of therapy is more determined by the underlying qualities than it is by the specific approach. So there are specific approaches though that may be more effective given certain types of issues or problems that a person is seeking therapy for. But the effectiveness of therapy has a lot to do with what's called a therapeutic alliance. This is a relationship between the therapist and the client that's characterized by things like acceptance, pairing, respect, and attention. Another important aspect of therapy that you can reflect on and think is going to be present in each of these is that clients can talk openly about how they're feeling and about their personal struggles. Each of these therapies is going to be effective if the person can examine aspects of themselves that they usually take for granted. And then entering therapy improves clients' morale. And so regardless of the type of therapy, just taking action, any action, suggests that things will get better. It provides a sense of hope. And then every form of therapy really requires clients to commit themselves to change their lifestyle or some aspect of their lives. Simply by coming to a therapy session, they're reaffirming their commitment to feel, in the case of Joya, less anxious or less depressed to overcome their fears. And in the case of someone who has an addiction, to conquer some bad habit and often to conquer or to overcome those feelings of anxiety or depression. And then between sessions, the client will work to make progress so that they can report at the next session. In addition to insight and behavioral therapies, another approach is a category called biomedical therapies. These are physiological interventions that are intended to reduce the symptoms associated with psychological disorders. As you learned about the history of the treatment of disorders, early biomedical interventions were inhumane and they violated the rights of patients. They included such things as lobotomy and insulin shock therapy, just to name a couple. Two prominent biomedical therapies today are drug therapy and electroconvulsive therapy. We're also going to be looking at a couple of additional ones. One is transcranial magnetic stimulation, and another one involves stimulating the vagus nerve. Many times students are surprised to learn that electroconvulsive therapy is actually used today, but it is. And it's a medical treatment that's most commonly used in patients who have severe depression or bipolar disorder that hasn't responded to other treatments. This type of therapy involves a brief electrical stimulation of the brain while the patient is under anesthesia. And it's typically administered by a team of trained medical professionals that include the patient's psychiatrist, an, an anesthesiologist, and typically a nurse or a physician assistant. Because with any type of medical intervention that involves anesthesia, there are risks. There's a lot of research that shows how effective ECT can be in helping people who have major depression. And as I mentioned, this is used when someone has not responded to other types of treatments. It's also useful in helping people with bipolar disorder, and it's also useful in helping people sometimes who have schizophrenia. I wanna point out that among people who have depression, ECT has been shown to produce improvement substantially in about 80% of patients. Interestingly, ECT is sometimes used in treating people who have what's called catatonia, or you may have heard the term catatonic. And this is where a person can be very agitated or on the other end of the spectrum, unresponsive. And a person who has catatonia can seriously injure themselves or they can, when they're unresponsive, develop severe dehydration from not eating or drinking. And so ECT is typically used when other treatments like medications and psychotherapy for this person haven't worked. This can also be useful in helping people who need rapid treatment response because of the severity of their condition, like being at risk for suicide. And I think it's important to point out that ECT is recognized as an effective treatment by the American Psychiatric Association and also by the American Medical Association and the National Institute of Mental Health. 
And this is not only true in the United States, but it's true for similar organizations in other countries like in Canada and in Great Britain. So this is not something only used in the United States or recognized. While ECT can be very effective, just like any type of treatment that is a medical procedure, there are some risks and it's been associated with short-term memory loss and some difficulty learning. Sometimes when people have this type of therapy, they have trouble remembering events that happened just in the weeks before the treatment or a little earlier than that. But in most cases, memory problems improve within a couple of months. And some patients though, uh, will have some longer lasting problems. And so it's important for the patient and their physician to weigh the benefits with the risks. And then also there are some risks of general anesthesia. So these risks need to be taken into consideration. But for people who have severe depression that is not being effectively treated, this can be very beneficial and the risks will outweigh those benefits. Or I'm sorry, the benefits I should say outweigh the risks. A very interesting approach that some of you may not have heard about is what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is used to treat depression that hasn't responded to other therapies. And what it involves is the use of rapidly alternating magnetic fields that stimulate specific areas of the brain. Now, ECT, the way that it works is it causes a seizure. And this works differently though, because it does not cause a seizure and the patient is awake throughout this process. So the person does not have to have anesthesia. So there's a reduced risk. This type of therapeutic intervention tends to have only very mild set side effects. So the person won't experience the issues of memory problems or learning difficulties. And remember with ECT, these are typically short lived, but for some they are longer lived. And so there are only pretty mild effects in terms of side effects from this type of therapy. And a person might have headaches or some um, pain at the stimulation site, but it can be very effective. So those side effects are often seen as worthwhile because the benefits can be so great. And this type of therapy is usually given about four to five times a week for four to six weeks. Now, another approach is what's called vagus nerve stimulation. And this was originally developed as a treatment for seizure disorders. And what researchers found was that people who were getting this treatment also, who also had depression were experiencing some relief. And so this is now used in some patients who have depression that hasn't responded to other therapies. And what it involves is it involves implanting an electrical pulse generator under the skin in the patient's chest that provides intermittent electrical stimulation to what's called the vagus nerve in the neck. And um, this particular type of therapy is believed to work by using electricity to influence the production of, of brain chemicals, you know, the, what you've learned about neurotransmitters. And so, as you all know, depression has been tied to neurotransmitters. And so uh, there's the belief that that's how it's working. Now there's no physical involvement in the brain in this surgery. And for people who experience this approach, they are not going to feel those pulses. And what I think so interesting is that a person may experience activation when they're in the operating room, when they're getting this device, but they can also stimulate the device themselves. That's very interesting, I think. And so the person can um, stimulate the device using low level stimulation and then what the, the physician will, um, ad will adjust the level of stimulation that the person can experience. And this is modified based on what is going to make sense for that person. And so um, patients actually will have what's called a handheld magnet and they will control the stimulator at home. And this has to be activated by a doctor but when that magnet is swept over the pulse generator site, so it's activated by the doctor and the doctors um, you know, at the office, and then that magnet, when the person is at home, is swept over the pulse generator site and then extra stimulation is delivered. So there's a continuous undercurrent of stimulation and then the person can stimulate that, that impulse themselves. And not only can that person do it, but other family members could too. 
especially this is useful for people who have epilepsy. So it could be done by family members, friends, or caregivers. But for the person who has depression, they can do this themselves. And then we also have drug therapy. And therapeutic drugs fall into four main categories. There are anti-anxiety drugs, antipsychotic drugs, antidepressants, and mood stabilizers. Let's take a look at each of these. So first we have anti-anxiety drugs, and most of us are familiar with what they do. The goal is to relieve tension, apprehension, or nervousness, and very common ones are Valium and Xanax. Of course, we know that these can be abused, and so uh, these can be risky, especially if a person combines these with alcohol, it can cause death. So these drugs can provide fast relief, but there are some risks associated one is when a person combines this with alcohol, also people may be at risk for abusing them, becoming dependent. And so there are some newer drugs like Buspar that act slower with fewer sedative side effects. And Buspar is thought to have non-habit forming properties. And then antipsychotic drugs is another type of drug category. And these are used to gradually reduce psychotic symptoms. That could include things like hallucinations and delusions, hyperactivity, mental confusion. Hyperactivity alone, you would not be using antipsychotics, but when combined with hallucinations and delusions, this can be effective. And they're typically used to help people who are experiencing delusions due to schizophrenia, but they can also be useful in people who have bipolar disorder and are also experiencing delusions and hallucinations. And here are some common ones, but there are many others. Now, one of the problems here is that for people who take antipsychotics, there can be unpleasant side effects. And so a person may have relief of their symptoms. They maybe are no longer having hallucinations or delusions or those symptoms are dulled. Then what happens is they, the person feels like they're getting better and they don't like the side effects. And so they may get off of their medication. And then we see a return of those symptoms. And this is where you might see people who have been effectively treated with antipsychotics doing well, then they get off of their medication and they may end up needing to return to a mental health facility. I know that when I've watched television and I've seen advertisements for drug therapies, I've noticed that some drug therapies are advertising or advertised as having a risk for the development of what's called tardive dyskinesia. And this is a chronic neurological disorder where a person has chronic tremors and involuntary spastic movements. And this is irreversible. And some of the older antipsychotic drugs produced a greater risk of development of tardive dyskinesia. But the newer ones, the atypical antipsychotics, have a lower risk of these side effects. So drug companies have been continuously working to develop drugs that have a reduction of these very significant side effects that some people will experience. And of course, we have antidepressants, and this is probably one of the most popular category of drugs, and they gradually elevate mood. It can take a few weeks to a couple of months for a person who is going to experience benefit, if it is going to be the right drug, for them to feel the benefit of that antidepressant. The most commonly used antidepressants today are what are called SSRIs. These are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And what they do is they affect serotonin. One that you may have heard of is Zoloft. Now, this drug or these, this category of drugs can also be useful in helping people who have some, some type of anxiety disorder. Some of the side effects, though, that may lead people to choose not to use antidepressants, especially if um, the side effects are severe, are weight gain and sleep problems and sexual dysfunction. And so sometimes there are medications that a person may benefit from that they can take in combination with their SSRI that can reduce some of these side effects, especially the sleep problems and sexual dysfunction. And more recently, as some of you may know, there's been some increased concern that this class of drugs might increase the risk of suicide in adolescents. And the newest class of antidepressants are what are called SNRIs. And these work on serotonin and norepinephrine receptors. And these are thought to, based on the research, produce stronger antidepressant effects 
than the older SSRIs. But there may also be more side effects. And so again, just like with any therapy, the risks have to be, be weighed with the benefits. And then we have the category of mood stabilizers. And these are used to control mood swings in patients who have bipolar mood disorders. And lithium is one that has been used for many years to treat bipolar disorder, but there are many dangerous side effects, including toxicity or death if the person gets the medication at high concentrations. And so a person has to regularly visit their doctor to get blood work done to make sure that there is uh, no toxicity. And they also need to be looking at their blood pressure because a person who takes lithium is at an increased risk of developing stroke. And they should not go off of lithium on their own because this can also increase one's risk of having stroke. And then we have some newer mood stabilizers that some of you may have heard of, like Valproate. And this is um, seems to be just as effective as drugs like lithium, but has fewer side effects. So overall, we know that drugs can provide for many people the relief of symptoms from severe disorders that can't be helped by other therapies. Sometimes people may not have severe mental health issues, but they may benefit still from these drugs and they may be temporarily on these drugs while they go through therapy. So sometimes drugs can be effective when a person's going through therapy and then the person may not need to be on the drugs anymore. For others, they may need to be on those medications for the rest of their lives. So some people argue that drugs only treat symptoms, but not the underlying causes of disorders. But when we think about the biology of disorders, it would only make sense that just like any physical ailment, that a drug can be effective. And some argue that drugs are overprescribed and that people are overmedicated. And there may be some truth to this but many people report tremendous benefit from taking these medications. And also I do wanna point out that there are only a couple of countries in the world that allow for the advertising of pharmaceuticals and that's the United States and New Zealand. So some argue that it's because of these advertisements that people are taking more of these drugs and that otherwise they may seek alternative approaches to therapy. Side effects, some people argue might be worse than the symptoms that the drugs are used to treat, especially if we think about, for example, the older class of antipsychotics, which for some people could leave them with those severe tremors, that tardive dyskinesia. Overall though, what you'll find when you talk with people who use medications to treat depression or anxiety is that many people, when they find that right medication, feel that they are freed from those symptoms, especially when they combine that drug with therapy. What's interesting to note though, is that researchers are looking forward at new approaches to treating disorders that are also biomedical interventions, but instead of using a drug that a person may take every day, there may be other approaches, including genetic modification or including stimulation of the vagus nerve, as you learned, or other approaches. So it will be interesting to see where we go in the future with medications and biomedical interventions in general. Psychotherapy began as a form of one-on-one -on -one dialogue between therapists and their clients meant to yield insight. Today, therapists have many approaches from which to choose. And as you learned, each therapy emphasizes different concepts and methods. For this reason, the best approach for a particular person or problem may vary. In this video, you learned about insight approaches to therapy. Freud's initial intent in developing psychoanalysis was to provide patients with an insight therapy that could resolve psychological problems by gaining a conscious understanding of previously unconscious psychodynamic conflicts. A psychoanalyst might use free association and dream analysis to help Julia, who you learned about in the beginning of this video, to realize that her anxieties originate, say, in an unconscious fear of dying. Julia was approaching the age at which her aunt died prematurely of a heart attack 22 years ago. Psychoanalysts expect that this insight will discharge Julia's unconscious pressures and alleviate her general sense of anxiety. In contrast, you learned about behavior therapy, 
cognitive therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. We can call these action therapies. And this is because they generally focus on directly changing troubling thoughts and behaviors. In this video, you learned about behavioral approaches that are based on the principles of operant and classical conditioning. You also learned about cognitive behavioral therapy, which incorporates both the behavioral approach and one that focuses on challenging maladaptive thinking. A behavioral therapist would spend little time on why Julia felt anxious. Rather, she might help Julia learn some relaxation techniques to directly relieve her anxieties when they got too strong. A cognitive behavioral therapist would focus on helping Julia to learn some relaxation techniques to relieve her anxieties when they got too strong and challenge the irrational thoughts that might be contributing to her anxiety. Psychoanalysis can be thought of as a directive therapy. And this is where the therapist leads the patient through the therapeutic process. So based on her analysis of Julia's free associations and dreams, her psychoanalyst might direct Julia's awareness towards her unconscious fear of dying. Without this direction, Julia might resist gaining the insight needed to overcome her anxiety. But in an approach that's non-directive, and you learned about some of these approaches, the role of the therapist is to create the conditions under which the client can resolve their own psychological issues. In client-centered therapy, as you learned in this video, it would be assumed that Julia must articulate her own problems, that she has the answer, and she must actively seek to resolve the issues or the answers to her problems herself. In non-directive therapy, the therapist's role is to support Julia in her growing understanding, not to tell Julia what is wrong with her or how to fix it. In the end, Julia found relief from her symptoms of social anxiety and depression. Overall, what was most important was not the specific approach. Instead, it was what had happened between Julia and her therapist. They had formed a therapeutic alliance, a relationship that was characterized by acceptance caring, respect, and attention. Julia was able to talk openly and honestly about her beliefs, her emotions, and her personal difficulties. She was able to examine aspects of herself that she had previously taken for granted. Simply taking action began to improve Julia's morale, and she developed a commitment to change. If after watching this video, or after reading the chapter, you have any questions, as always, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I've provided a link on our course site to the Northeast State Counseling Services Center. I'd encourage each of you, if you're having any feelings of anxiety, depression, or if you're experiencing stress, or anything that's distressing you, I'd encourage you to reach out to that free resource. I wish all of you the best. Please let me know again if you have any questions.